Today we're going to be looking at State of Grace from 1990, it's directed by Phil Joanno, stars Sean Penn, Gary Oldman, Robin Wright and Ed Harris, and it's the story of Irish hoodlums in Hell's Kitchen as they face the changing times. So this was, this was your selection for the, um, for the podcast, so yeah. I'm, I'm guessing you've got a backstory with it. Yeah, I mean I don't want to make like too big a point of it, but watching State of Grace was probably one of the defining moments of my film watching career it really uh really blew me away um at the time i was still in the royal navy and i was stationed in the south atlantic so i was on a patrol boat called the dumbarton castle i was 19 years old and we used to get um boxes of videotapes sent from the uk down to the south atlantic and we'd be patrolling between the falkland islands and south georgia looking out for the Argentinians, any incursions. Was it something the Navy supplied? Yes, because obviously there's no broadcast TV, no internet, uh, no DVDs. You know, it was just a box of VHS tapes that turned up every three months. Mm. And then wherever you went, you'd kind of do some swaps. And I was kind of the film nerd, so I was the first one into the box. And I'd heard about this movie, um, missed it when I was back in the UK. So it came in a clamshell with a photocopied cover right. and I took it straight out and put it in, didn't even unpack the rest of the box and I watched it straight off and, and then I was just transported completely. So you've, you'd have heard of it and you were looking forward to it already. What, what, what led you to be looking forward to it? When I was at school, uh, Gary Oldman had been in the firm on BBC Two. Do you remember that? Yeah, I remember that being on. Yeah, it's really good, but like we all uh, at school were like, quoting him, pushing each other around and, you know, Yeti! You know, it was all that sort of stuff Get, getting it wrong then, really. yeah yeah completely yeah yeah, we, yeah we'd miss the point of it you know it's only when you you're older and you watch the firm you're like oh right it's not pro it's anti yeah i get it now i get it and so like gary oldman had been kind of on the radar sean penn i'd seen in casualties of war while i was doing my basic training and i'd seen at close range maybe on tape or something so i kind of knew gary oldman sean penn and the idea of them being in a film together was kind of looking forward to that. I don't, I don't know where I'd seen it reviewed. I think I was reading Empire magazine or something at the time. Were you a Phil Jouadou fan? Had you seen his, his U2 film? I would kind of. I think I'd seen Rattle and Hum, but I certainly hadn't paid note of who made it. Mm. And after seeing this, I did go back and watch Three O'Clock High, which I quite liked. I've got this murky memory of it being around. The first time I saw it was earlier this year. You got it me for Christmas, mm -hmm. and I think we watched it like Christmas... Christmas Day or oh, Boxing yeah, perfect, Day or something. Perfect Christmas Day. Perfect movie. Christmas movie. Um, and then rewatched it again this week for this podcast. Oh, so yeah, it's all it's fairly fresh to me. Yeah, sure, sure. So it was released uh, the same week as Goodfellas in the States, and I, th I think it just got steamrolled by that. I mean, it's the same because Goodfellas didn't wasn't even a hit, was it? It was just like you you bring out two gangster films with stars in mm. in the same week, and you know one of them all drown. And so this, they I think they put it back. For release around the world, 1991, put it back like eight months everywhere else. Um, yeah, and I caught up with it on VHS in 1992. In fact, the uh, one of my pet peeves with this film's releases is that there's always a spoiler on the back of the uh, the case, whether it's the VHS or the... Does it um, always give away the twist? That... It gives away the twist, yeah, um, which we will do as well, so uh, spoiler alert. If you haven't seen it, you should probably yeah. watch it first. Yeah, always, um, before you listen to us. But Sean Penn is playing an undercover cop, and that twist, like, just as I was watching it, you know, in a, in a mess deck in the, the Antarctic Circle, I was just like, that's the best thing I've ever seen! <laughs> and then when I picked up the case, because I, I hadn't even bothered looking at the back, it gives that twist away, so I got a marker pen, I crossed it out, <laughs> and every time I've bought it for other people, you included, on, yeah, you, on the Blu-ray. a piece of paper <laughs> Yeah, I still, uh, still cross that out, because um, I think one of the writers, I think it was David Rabe who did... Um, uncredited rewrites on Dennis McIntyre's script yeah. he said he hated that twist that he wanted to uh, flag it up from the outset so that the scenes where especially where Ed Harris is interrogating Sean Penn in his house it was like there'd be an extra layer of tension there mm. but I love it the way it just sort of comes out of nowhere there's that sort of confusion about what's happening and then it all snaps into focus. And to be fair, if you're paying attention, it, it does flag it up early on when you've got that meeting with the John Turturro character. Yeah, yeah. I mean, they've met and exchanged a bag of guns before this, you know, supposed confrontation. Yeah, exactly, place. yeah. yeah so there the, if the you're clues looking are for there, it, yeah. yeah. So we should, get, um, we should get into it then, really. Yeah, let's... Um, um, well, shall we... Do you know anything about the, uh, the background to the film? Not really, no. So what I know of State of Grace is that it was a project that 
um, originated with Mike Medavoy at Orion Pictures, and he was cultivating a script called Hell's Kitchen, um, which was derived from a New York Times article about the Westies, a gang of Irish mobsters whose boss, Jimmy Coonan, formed a, a lethal alliance with the Gambino crime family in the 1970s, and they were driven out of business by the then US attorney, Rudolph Giuliani. When Sean Penn came on, he'd asked for rewrites by David Rabe, who worked on... Casualties of War. Yeah, that's it, yeah. And he worked on the, the relationships and the dialogue. I read in Sean Penn's uh, biography that Rabe said if he'd have known Dennis McIntyre was ill, he probably wouldn't have done the rewrites because mm. he was touching somebody else's work. But he didn't know that at the time. And in fact, McIntyre died a few months before the film was released yeah. from, I think, stomach cancer. I did a, a Wikipedia... You know, some light research on Dennis McIntyre. It looks like his, his two most popular plays are about class relations, which yeah, does that's kind of it. Gentrification, aren't they? Yeah. yeah, he's really sort of ahead of the curve on that. Mm. And the damage to communities, and it's a shame. I I don't know how much was how much of that was in his original script, but it's only sort of paid lip service to in this, isn't it? A couple yeah. of yeah comments about yuppies and dog shit. And, yeah, that's it. And that's sort of it. And really. changing the name from Hell's Kitchen to Clinton. Mm. When did it when did it become like a go project was it Sean Penn being attached or as i understand the uh, the green light process it was um Phil Joanna who was like super hot off rattle and hum mm. you know which a blockbuster music documentary and i think he was attached before Sean Penn and i think Gary Oldman was the first actor attached and he went on the basis of the script and not the director mm. um and then i think that sort of combination got Sean Penn. I think he knows you too. And uh, I think there was a, a nice connection there between them all. And that's how he got involved. And he brought Robin Wright in. Ed Harris was brought in to replace Bill Pullman. Um, John C. Riley, I think Sean Penn brought with him from Casualties yeah, of I wonder, War. Yeah, I wondered if they were friends. Because it's yeah. odd that, that two very early John C. Riley performances are alongside Sean Penn. Yeah, and later ones as well. He's in Thin Red Line, obviously, with him. Oh, of course, yeah. yeah. Uh, Phil Joanno's father... Phil Joanna Sr. was um, a leading advertising executive through the 60s and 70s, kind of a Don Draper type. He was at the advertising agency Daily, and they had clients such as Nestle, Honda, Hilton, and he worked on uh, election campaigns for Nixon and Reagan. So, you know, he was very much an advertising guy, and I think Phil Joanna's Jr. has been in and out of advertising his entire career, and I think he's the film's just kind of... He does it every couple of years mm. to sort of... Oh, I don't know. I want to say offset, <laughs> but you know, uh, offset the damage. Yeah, yeah, no, no. But his father actually was one of the f pioneers of kind of pro bono advertising work for drugs charities and all of that kind of oh, stuff. Right. So, yeah, when his father retired, he went and did his uh, Bachelor of Arts in Fine Art and mm. became a painter and just kind of lived out the rest of his life painting. Oh, nice. and, yeah, so I think he had the balance. Mm. Phil Joanna went to USC. And his graduation film was seen by Steven Spielberg, who called him and gave him two episodes of Amazing Stories to direct. Oh, yeah. And Spielberg had the script to Three O'Clock High, and he gave that to Joanna. So it's kind of a, a Amblin, non-Amblin production. Mm -hmm. And then after that, Phil Joanna came onto this. Is Three O'Clock High good then? Because I just saw it on IMDb and I just thought, no. Nope. Yeah, I remember it being good. You know, I haven't seen it since, I don't know, mid-90s. So um, I remember it being quite slick and cool and lots of kind of wacky shots and angles and mm. things. So that probably sounds like the worst film in the world <laughs> now, now that I've pitched it. A high, but, yeah. high school movie from the mid-80s. <laughs> yeah, that's it. Described in those terms. But yeah, I mean... But it must have been quite a hot project at the time because, I mean, the sort of key collaborators that I look for... Yeah, the DOP and the, and, and the editor yeah, are, yeah. are really, really good. Yeah, they're fantastic, aren't they? Yeah, I mean, Jordan Cronenworth, um, the guy who shot Altered States and yeah, Blade, Blade Runner, Runner and yeah. Cut Way, and, yeah, yeah. and Claire Simpson. Yeah, who's... yeah. She'd won an Oscar at this point for Platoon, hadn't she? Yeah, she's just like mainstream genius. I read an article about her on Cine Montage, and she was the uh, the editor that replaced Kevin Spacey with Christopher Plummer in All the Money in the World. Oh, right, yeah. okay. <laughs> <laughs> so there's some uh, cine magic for you. She also did um, a most wanted man yeah well it's just like her credits are, are, i guess you can kind of pick and choose because the credits mm. are always like interesting mainstream mm. projects yeah so i think what's interesting is those key heads of department are in their sort of 40s and 50s but the rest of the talent the director was 29 sean penn was 30 gary Oldman was 31 robin wright was 24 i just think there's a really kind of nice youthful energy and ambition to the film as well i think they've really 
set out to do something that was kind of modern at mm -hmm. the time. You know, this idea of characters that are more introspective, even given their position as gangsters and lowlifes and undercover cops. And yeah, I, I just think there's something really nice about how ambitious the project is and that youthful energy that it has. Um, when I was watching it the second time round, one of the things that did strike me is that there's there's an odd conflict between trying to bring youthful energy to it and, and trying to enliven it by just, I think, like overall, the, the basic story and some of the other choices just kind of still, it's still an old film yeah, in, in but, new clothes. Yeah, but don't you think they're trying to do like an epic gangster film? It's, this is the thing. This for me, it falls quite badly between two stools because it wants to be kind of streetwise and modern and, and edgy, but at the same time, it's it's not edgy enough. It's it's got you know the it's got the big sweeping Ennio Morricone music, yeah, which yeah. feels more like pastiche. It feels like a Brian De Palma movie. Oh. Whenever the music, yeah, comes I did in. make a few notes about Brian De Palma comparisons, but and there's you know I, I kept unfairly comparing it to Mean Streets which keeps everything yeah, yeah. street level and sure. everything absolutely gritty in texture but but with this for example there's an awful lot of crane shots to introduce scenes yeah which I which to me is is good if you're De Palma and you're doing big and sweeping and epic but this doesn't feel like an epic story it's, it's quite a sort of fairly mundane story oh no I find it really Shakespearean the uh the conflict like between the family and that's kind of what I mean though it's kind of old and tried and tested and mm. you really know which direction it's going to go in at every stage but we should get into that scene yeah, by scene yeah. so starting with the credit sequence which I think is really really nice yeah I mean uh, I'll have to caveat that I haven't checked but I think it was very similar to the opening credits for Cutter's Way which I thought were a slow motion parade as well oh, yeah, with okay. eerie music mm -hmm. um, and that's another Jordan Cronworth yeah, yeah. picture you always know you're going to get beautiful pictures with Jordan Cronin, yeah. don't you? Whenever his name pops up at the beginning, it's like, wow, okay, <laughs> okay, we're going to get nice pictures, guaranteed. And the, the music for that gave me extremely high hopes for the soundtrack overall, because mm -hmm. it's a, a lovely piece of music, yeah, Ennio yeah. Morricone, kind of sweeping and romantic, but at the same time, it's got this foreboding, strange so. foreboding mm -hmm. um, repeated note that kind of clashes with the main melody. Really nice titles, um, great choice of typeface as well. <laughs> yeah, nice, um, nice typeface. Yeah, um, so that was that was a really promising opening. Mm -hmm. And then, yeah, we're straight into this um, opening sequence with Sean Penn and John Turturro and uh, I think it's the Manhattan Bridge, or is it... No, I think it's... Is it the 49th Street Bridge? Couldn't tell you. Yeah, I'm not sure. Obviously, I don't know my New York bridges as well as I'd hope. Mm. They obviously know each other. John Turturro gives him a bag of guns and some other stuff. Uh, he says, like, I'll see you tonight. You ready? Can you do this? And he's like, yeah, yeah, I'll see you tonight. Smoking, tracking shots, sweeping around Sean Penn in his denim and uh, leather jacket combo, quiffed hair, smoking fags. Just looks so cool. I was quite pleased with this because I've seen this after a lot of Sean, other Sean Penn films. I didn't see this in kind of chronologically in terms yeah, of Sean sure. But his, um, his hair is not too distracting this time <laughs> round. I was a bit worried in this opening mm. scene because it's quite tall. Mm. Um, but no, I noticed later on in the film it wasn't, it wasn't you know, the usual six-inch yeah, yeah, quiff that he prefers, regardless of what character he's playing, what period it's set in. Most of his characters have quiffs, it's just a coincidence. Yeah, why does his character in The Thin Red Line have a quiff when it's set in the 1940s? He's pioneering hairstyles. He's pioneering hairstyles, yeah. And then we, after this we go straight into the, uh, the drug deal that isn't a drug deal. There's that nice scene with um, James Russo talking about shooting his dog, saying his dog uh, bit him, and then he ends up uh, mm. shooting the dog in the Clear. face. Mm. <laughs> yeah. Do you think that's a bit of foreshadowing, so you're not necessarily supposed to like his character very much? Well, I think it just yes. makes sure there's no... Yeah, of course. Yeah, he's, he is kind of um, because like of, collateral damage in the, yeah, in the that's it. Uh, undercover operation. And because he's it? killed a dog, we're happy for him to happy die. Happy for him to die later yeah, in the movie. It. So the drug deal goes wrong. Terry kills two guys, one of them John Turturro, uh, the drug deal. And then uh, he goes home, basically, after being away for 12 years. He goes back to find his old friends. In um, Hell's Kitchen. In Hell's Kitchen. And f he catches up with Jackie in an Irish bar, um, playing the Pogues, just in case you were... Just in case you were <laughs> you know, wondering if it was an Irish bar. Yeah. Yeah. And then, uh, yeah, there's a reunion. We introduced to Gary Oldman. He's pretty wild and camp <laughs> that's my notes i wrote wild and camp it's yeah it's wild and camp um i mean i i have a lot of problems with the two performances in this movie <laughs> we can come to sean penn a little bit later but this is gary oldman's scene and 
he's kind of sniffing and twitching and stumbling and wiping greasy hair out of his face in this scene um, and then occasionally goes into some shouty rant or goes berserk and violent and that's basically the template for every scene every yeah, other scene he does in the movie. That, but his eyes uh, are, are conflicted <laughs> not they're not conflicted with each other his eyes you know i think there's something there about you know him not but it would be nice to see that something there in a scene maybe rather than just have it buried under this kind of grotesquely over the top performance i think it's really undisciplined it's just and and i've you know i've seen him in work prior to this i just think he's it's just trying too hard in this it just it's just way over the top Mm. Yeah, but I think his character's off the leash. I think that's, I think that's exactly how he's supposed to be. Okay, okay but if you want an off le- off the leash character, you've mm. got, and you're expecting an audience to spend two hours with them, you can't expect them to just kind of make allowances and keep, you know, keep biting their knuckle and saying, "Well, you know, he's off the leash." You know, you ex- you're asking people to spend two hours with somebody who's basically an idiot from the first scene that you mm. see them in. He's, you know, he's he doesn't have doesn't really have any depth or any intelligence that he's hiding behind no but he's also living his life outside of all of the rules of society he's kind of he's like free as a character this stuff is great on paper but watching gary oldman chew the scenery is just it's just hard work oh man i love it every time i kind of wish i'd had that energy when i was that young you know to be that crazy i wish you know that's what i feel when i look at it like Mm. so much freedom and chaos but if you've met somebody like that in life you just think oh yeah no, and walk really away. hard work this and is the thing yeah you get punched out and yeah. you know it just wouldn't be any fun you but can't. that's the point of the movies right mm. it's the escapism so we meet you know we meet um we meet frankie and his gang and his gang his faceless gang who never really get any characterization oh, no, that's a shame because one of the actors in there is uh tom waits not tom waits the singer thomas g waits and he was windows in the thing and he was also fox in the warriors so and he's had like a long kind of mm. character actor career and it'd be nice if he kind of had a little bit more screen time cause... it it would be nice if there's a bit more sort of background detail and texture in the film generally mm. it, especially in terms of the sp- i mean you've got perfect opportunity to give you know colorful supporting characters even if they're just given but they're just basically surly blokes who stand in the background yeah I mean, looking dull they just sort of walk around behind yeah the... dressing identically mm. yeah it's a shame there. Yeah, I'll agree with you on that. And then they have a little bit of uh, you and me time, don't they? They go up onto the roof and shoot some guns, play with some dead man's hands, talk about gentrification, all the things that guys do. Have a drink, all the things that guys do. All the things that you see. This is, what, this is, this is what I mean about the movie starting at 11. It's just like, okay, so this guy's a fucking idiot and he's a psychopath. And I just I just tune out so quickly when this stuff starts happening. Yeah, you know, at least with Johnny Boy in Mean Streets, you just meet, you, you know you get to meet him as an irresponsible. Yeah, he's yeah, more of he's a delinquent not... than a than a, a psychotic murderer. Yeah, I'll, mm. I'll give you that. I mean, I could go with it if things were were built a bit more, but you just kind of start with the meter in the red Mm-mm. with with Frankie, and even with Sean Penn kind of toning it down and being the straight man, it's still still quite difficult. Apparently that's based on true testimony of uh, gangsters, this idea of using a dead man's hands to put fingerprints on your favourite gun so you don't have to keep throwing it away. As a dead man's hand turns up in The Departed some years later, another Irish gangster story, isn't it? Yeah. Jack Nicholson's playing with the one at the dinner table. Oh, right, okay. Yeah. So, yeah, the next morning they go for coffee um, and... Um, the idea is that they've been up drinking all night. Yeah. So yeah. they haven't, like, had a snooze or anything. You get, you, <laughs> I got you, you that. Get that don't I got you? that, you yeah. That. And Kate, or Kathleen, who is Frankie's sister, turns up. She's looking for a handout, isn't she? Looking She's for a handout. Crashed She's crashed a car yeah. and, you know, needs a bit of cash. So she can kind of wafts in like a fairy tale princess with her beautiful... Oh, she's straight off the princess bride. She's literally... Very beautiful hair. Um, I actually really, really liked her character by the end of the movie. It's a good performance, isn't it, actually? And they don't compromise her either. You know, she wants out and she decides out and she is out by the yeah, end of it. Yeah, that's it. And yeah, all the stuff that Sean Penn's talking about trying to achieve mm. with his life... She's already done. And yeah. She's only taken a backward step because of him. Yeah. And she, once she clicks to that, she immediately dismisses him and, and carries on with her life. Mm. Yeah, I think that it's a really strong character. Character art. Yeah, yeah. yeah it's mm. really good. But initially, I was a little bit distracted by the fact that she was... she. I'm being very, very cynical. Yeah. And, you know, she, she is an angel compared to is, these guys. She is an absolute she? angel, and she does appear to be acting a little bit with her hair. Mm. But I'm, I'm really glad. I think she's just a good, good solid character, yeah, good solid really good. work in the film. This scene does have uh, one of, one of my favourite lines in it, which uh, 
when Terry says that he's back, uh, back in the in the old neighbourhood. Kate looks at him and she just says, "Are you nostalgic for mayhem?" <laughs> Which I think pretty much sums up, you know, the tone of the film as well. You know, there's there's something about this kind of the chaos that they bring is is liberated in its own way. I mean, it's terrifying as well. I think this scene starts with Gary Oldman saying that the reason there's no cops in the kitchen is that they shot somebody in the head last year and since then the cops have stopped coming around. Yeah. And then we go down to the dockyard and we meet John C. Riley and some um, caricature Italian mobsters. <laughs> yeah, I, <know. laughs> I really like this scene. It's at the intrepid uh, Aaron Space Museum. Right. Um, and the first time I ever went to New York... I went to this location because it was in the film and took <laughs> okay. to, had a picture taken of myself at this location. <laughs> oh, excellent. We should um, say there's some amazing locations in this movie. Yeah, yeah, you feel like you're on the street, don't you? Yeah, whoever scouted it, like derelict you know, tenements mm-hmm. and, and big broad locations like, like the museum you just mentioned. Yeah, yeah. It makes the city look quite stunning, doesn't yeah, it? Yeah, yeah, yeah. But it's still at that cusp of that transition from being a... a city that's entirely a tourist attraction mm. and being still a bit kind of run down and dangerous and you know and that's part of the subplot to the film is this gentrification this moving mm. the scumbags out so there's better for <laughs> nice people to live in i'm quite surprised that it that it took that long because i probably wrongly observed when we talk about prince of the city that that was made about 1980 that it was you know 1980 would probably have been the last time you could have found what looked like bombed out locations oh yeah okay like you'd see in wolfen around the same time Mm -hmm. but no it must still have been you know a work in progress throughout the entire 80s such a sprawling space isn't it yeah it's that i mean that area now hell's kitchen that has the um the high line through it doesn't it the uh elevated walkway Mm. the scene with the gangsters beside the intrepid it's one of those scenes I really love because it has one of my favourite headbutts <laughs> in a film ever. It's such a colossal headbutt that Gary Oldman gives to uh, one of those Irish gangsters that it sort of always makes me wince. That's funny. My my favourite headbutt of all time is a Gary Oldman one as well from The Firm. Oh, yeah, OK. Where he's going around to see um, the black member of the gang and he goes round um, to his flat and his brother answers the door and won't let him in. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And he says, oh, oh, how can I find the words? I can't. And it just heads butts in. <laughs> Oliver Reed actually has a really good headbutt in one of the Musketeers films. Or oh, maybe right. it's The Prince and the Pauper, but definitely one of those where he uh, says to other characters when he has, takes their hand and says, your fingernails are dirty. When they look down at their hands, he headbutts them. <laughs> he does it a couple of times. It's really random. So, but we are talking about big, fat, cartoonish Italian gangsters, aren't we? Yeah, but what this... do Italian gangsters look like? Well, they don't. They can't all look like that. <laughs> nice suits is part of the thing, isn't it? That that sort of mannerism and you know the etiquette of the criminal underworld. Mm. I think the Italian aspect of it. I think in this film they sort of they look at that quite closely. This this the difference in cultures between the Italian and the Irish. I think mm. they they make a point of of showing that. So these sort of hoodlums drinking and, and causing havoc compared to the more disciplined approach of the Sicilians, I think it's... I will take that on board. I <laughs> thought they were just playing with movie stereotypes and cliches. I mean, it's a shorthand, but... isn't it? As soon as yeah. you see them, you know, you know what they do. Yeah. You know, the way they're shaking him down. Give us the goddamn money. You know, we take one of your fingers or whatever it is. Yeah, sure. I mean, What would you expect a member of the Yakuza to look like? Extremely slender, sharp suit. <laughs> yeah, With black, black tie. Yeah, sunglasses. So you have got John C. Riley. <laughs> yeah, John C. He's really good in this. He's thing. really good. I I do like John C. Riley's comedy, but I really, really like his straight stuff as mm-hmm. well. Yeah. So you look at John C. Riley in something like Step Brothers, and then compare it to We Need to Talk About Kevin. Mm. You know, he can be in a Terrence Malick film, and he can be in a uh, Will Ferrell film. Yeah, uh, and he can straddle the two as well. He can do a straight performance in exactly, something like Boogie yeah. Nights and still get laughs. Exactly. Through, yeah. Through the yeah, he's uh, he's always dependable, isn't he? As soon mm. as you see him on screen, you're like, okay. Yeah. Right. Considering all his characters like look exactly the same, <laughs> he's is very good at making the distinction between them, which is quite a skill. And you sort of don't yeah. don't, don't do any sort of transformation. Mm. He's good in this as well. You know, he's he's into the mafia for eight grand. Can't get out of it. He's quite hopeless, but he feels like he's a guy with a, a good. Good heart. Good heart, yeah. I mean, he manages to nail that within one scene, which is pretty good. So they send the uh, Italian gangsters packing. Sean Penn pins one of them to the, the car. Blood pouring yeah. out of his nose. Gun in his head. He's like, you know, just get lost. In the next scene, we're introduced to, um, I guess, one of the movie's secret weapons, which is um, Ed Harris. I think he's, like, one of the highlights of the movie. Oh, yeah, he's great. I, rem- I remember this period as well. It was just like, is Ed Harris going to be a star? 
Yeah, he'd done the Abyss, hadn't he? Yeah, the was... Abyss was like was, was one of the big breakthrough roles, yeah. supposedly, but it mm. never really, never really landed. No, but I think what it it did was just say like he's a fucking good actor. Yeah. <laughs> you know, you watch the Abyss and he's brilliant in that. You've seen him doing sort of character stuff and supporting roles mm. throughout the eighties, but yeah, right, he can carry a movie. Yeah, yeah. yeah. I mean, he was the um, the star of Night Riders, wasn't he? The Corman film about. <laughs> Yeah, I guess I guess of... I guess that convinced fifteen people he could carry a movie. <laughs> yeah, what else was he in in between? Right stuff. Oh yeah, he plays um, John Glenn, doesn't he? Mm. Yeah. Okay, great. But I remember this period when he was sort of super hot. I don't. Mm. He was going to be a star. Yeah, yeah. And he's got that kind of intensity um, that just kind of burns through the screen in in this movie. And you see, and it just didn't quite happen. I think he made made better choices in terms of yeah, the movies. Yeah, but he's, he's in loads of good. Good, well, that's, good that's, movies all that's what I mean. And across the genres. You but know, he didn't make the stupid movies that you need to make to be a star, to do that sort of crossing over. Yeah, he sure. just carried on doing good stuff. After this, he carried on playing those kind of intense character roles, you mm. know, from The Rock to Paris Trout. Glenn Gary, Glenn Ross. Apollo 13. I mean, you know, the, it's such an imp- impressive list of characters. I mean, he's done lots of stuff that I haven't seen either. Mm. Um did you see his movie Pollock? No. That he directed. No, I remember it coming out. It was, it was quite a big thing. Yeah, yeah, I really like that. Mm. So next we travel to New Jersey, where Frankie, the um, Hell's Kitchen Irish gangster boss, uh, now lives in a large suburban house. He's Jackie's brother, isn't he? He's Gary yeah. Oldman's character's older brother by like 10 years. Yeah. This scene is basically Frankie interrogating Terry to try and work out his backstory. You know, he's come up asking the mob for help to try and make this botched drug deal where he allegedly killed two people trying to make that go away and in return he offers his services to the crime family to pay for the uh... Frankie never seems to look that thoroughly does he you you would have thought that that the New York Irish mob would have some connections to the Boston Irish mob and perhaps yeah, maybe you know, maybe but I think perhaps Terry's face would have been known as a cop in Boston if he'd done a bit more legwork could have saved himself a lot more yeah, trouble. Yeah, yeah. But also, I think there's something about this film which you kind of only notice after a couple of views is that, yes, they're gangsters, but they're really, you know, they're the bottom of the barrel gangsters. Yeah. You know, they're scraping by with the scraps, and this is why they're kind of out of time, really. You know, they, they don't have the infrastructure or the organisation. They're still selling booze cheaply and threatening bar owners yeah and in small time shakedowns they're, they're and stuff really like kind that, of like yeah. they're, they're out of time this sort of block by block crime families it's it's over you know yeah and they are out of time the whole film is about them no that's true and frankie does know that i mean what he's effectively doing is selling his business to the italians isn't he it's, yeah, it's yeah. a payday isn't it yeah he's selling but it's not like he's got any choice you know he's being overtaken by uh, you know, there's a, a line later on where the italian mobster just says to him you know in a war we would crush you <laughs> like i hope you're not he says i hope you're not planning anything stupid because in a war we would crush you mm. and that's, that's it enough. yeah and he knows that and all the way through he's kind of uh, supplicant to the italians isn't he he knows that it's their city. That's very true, actually, yeah. I'm giving him more credit than he's due. Yeah, and his, his right-hand man, Pat, you know, he's he's kind of thorough, but I, I can't imagine him, you know, trawling microfish and he cross-referencing. Looked, he looked a little... I mean, obviously, I know he's supposed to be the scary backup guy, but he looked more like a government agent than a, <laughs> than a, a roughneck Irish gangster. Um, you know, he's always kind of impeccably suited and, yeah. and just had that kind of... He look, yeah, he looked like a hitman, but a government hitman. Yes, yes. Something you'd send to South America or something. I like, there's a few scenes with him where he's really good. He always seems like slightly distracted as well, which mm. I really like. I think he's a friend of Sean Penn's as well because he's in, he's in Colours, At Close Range. He's in I Am Sam, Into the Wild, The Weight of Water and Babel. Yeah, so, so I think Sean Penn's <laughs> taking, taking him along for the ride. Um, so I, I'm guessing that the next scene ticks a lot of boxes for you. <laughs> I like it, yeah. It's really chaotic, isn't it? You know, they drive into a New York City, they go to a tenement building that's been cleared of its uh, native residents and is being prepared for, like, gentrification and to send a message to the uh, the yuppies and the property developers. They set it on fire and burn it to the ground, mm. but not without first doing their 100-yard dash through the flaming building in a very extended set piece. Mm. Yeah. <laughs> so, yeah, yeah. I, 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 I don't know. I, not, not connecting with the characters. It didn't. It didn't. The scene didn't really. 
play for me. It was a little bit heavy handed for me. Yes, um, it's over the top, but I think, you know, this is it's an indulgence of the the cinematic storytelling, isn't it? To just mm-hmm. give you a big set piece you know i love the flames and gary oldman screaming and shouting all the way through when he leaps into the car and he's kind of <laughs> baying at the moon you know like a madman yeah. and sean penn's just sat next to him smoking and staring out the window like what have i got myself into but i think both like professionally as an actor and also the character apparently legend has it that when gary oldman first met sean penn to talk about doing this film he he sang like a virgin to him <laughs> <laughs> after he just finalised his divorce from Madonna. So I think I think Gary Oldman's definitely in the zone, the Hellraiser zone. All right. The next key scene for me is where we um, see Kathleen Kate at her job. Yeah, yeah. And I've got to be honest, I was really pleasantly surprised that she's got an ordinary job. Yeah, yeah, that's it. Generally in these movies, when they, they write like a, a white princess character who's mm. moved uptown, she's got, I was honestly... Having even having seen it earlier this year, mm. I was expecting it to be working in an art gallery. Yeah, <laughs> but no, she's just working like as a concierge in a hotel. Yeah, yeah it's really nice. She's got yeah, it's a normal job. It's an under this kind of like yeah, no, no, she's still struggling to make ends meet. But what she's done is cut all ties with the yeah. dependency on her family. You know, there's a scene later on where Ed Harris is like, "Didn't I always take care of you?" And he's really bossing her around and manhandling her, and she's mm. just like, like you can see that he doesn't get why she left. Yeah, um, and yeah, Terry goes to visit. Um, it's actually one of the moments when I was um, almost liked his character when he was quite quiet. You know, she's like, should I wait outside? And yeah, yeah. You know, no, 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 here's fine. Meet me here in an hour. Well, he knows, you know, we're at, the, at this point, if you're seeing it for the first time, you don't know that he's an undercover cop. So it seems strange for him to go from street level drug dealer, murderer to somebody that's quite polite and courteous and mm. understands the rules and the etiquette and later on when he's revealed to be a cop that this scene makes more sense yeah yeah. and he's much more you know he doesn't carry the burden of a murder on his shoulders when they're walking down the street having Mm. a chat and i think that those are the kind of little places where there's clues to who he really is yeah true she says oh nobody forgets their first love you know and they have this conversation uh he's been gone for 12 years in real life she's only 24 (laughs) so maybe uh that's part of the reason he left yeah could be I think her character is supposed to be the same age. So, yeah. yeah, yeah. We have a brief scene where Pat tracks down DeMarco to validate Terry's cover story. And then we go straight into a sequence where we see the Irish gangsters at work. We have Jackie turfing Terry out of bed to go on a job. And then we see them shaking down uh, a bar owner um, and trying to... It's, it's a really weird thing to get people out of bed at 2am to do. It's like you could... Could you not do this in the daytime? Yeah, yeah, it's not that. Yeah, you know, when when he's been woken up at two a.m. to go on a late night job, you think, "What well, are they going to break into something? They're going to steal yeah, something?" Yeah. It's like, "Are oh, you just going to like shake down a barman?" So they really are bottom of the barrel, aren't they? Yeah, that's it. Yeah, yeah. I mean, maybe they have better things to do during the day, but um, you know, it is. Yeah, I don't worry about the logic of it. Let's just go with the film. It's uh... no. I'm trying to work it into yeah. into a into a sympathetic reading of the characters. <laughs> um, uh, I, I think the reason why it happens at night is because the, the scene is a, a two-parter. You have the, what happens inside the bar, then you have what happens in the streets outside. Mm. And that scene outside is so beautifully lit. <laughs> you know, it would be much better to see that in the evening with the shadows and the silhouettes and the sparkles off the wall that you, you get in the night time than True. if you just shot it in the day. So. <laughs> I, I made a note, uh, music distracting, which I guess is a note I could scatter throughout all of my notes and this i do really find the music it's it's nice music but i do find it's from the wrong movie a lot of this movie would play a lot better with no music at all i think or you too were supposed soundtrack. to do the music but the recording of acton baby overran so i think i think and i think also i've got some evidence well some conjecture to back this up but i think that news must have come through quite late in the day because then the Ennio Morricone was hired to do this. Mm. Um, and I've just recently read a book, Ennio Morricone, sort of in his own words, oh, going yeah, okay. through his whole career. And he's very, very good and you know, very, very often would come to a project extremely late in the day, mm-hmm. write a very professional piece of work, hand it in, job done. And I do kind of get that feeling with this music. I, I, I feel that he's you know, maybe taken a few themes off the shelf. And yeah, sure, sure. Done it quickly. And it's, it's great, you know, very big professional music, mm. but it does not suit the film. Uh, I don't mind it, but I know what you're saying. Um, and I think I saw an interview with Phil 
Joanna where he was saying that he'd seen a few movies that Morricone did afterwards and because this movie kind of went off the radar he reused some, really? of, some of the themes he oh. had so he was like <laughs> you know I guess if you're going to steal from anyone you might as well steal from yourself and yeah that's really cheeky <laughs> I mean James Horner sort of made a career out of it but <laughs> I wouldn't have expected Morricone to do it yeah I, I just think either with no music or with I'm, I was a bit disappointed as well with kind of I mean, I know we're talking about Irish mobsters and they will listen to a certain kind of music, theoretically speaking. Yeah, sure. But we could have done better than just like, you know, is there, there's a Stones track, isn't there? Yeah, there's Rolling Stones, a little bit of driving gun, driving music. Guns and Roses. Gun, but Sinead Guns and Roses O'Connor. was still big at the time. This yeah, is but when, that's the thing, though. It's just like... It, it was popular music of the time, I think. Yeah, okay. It's just, it's a little bit, you know, unimaginative. It's chart, it's chart music. That's the stuff that people were listening to at the time. It's just you should you know if you're making a, a a movie a fantasy you shouldn't be beholden to just document what was in on on the radio at the time. Yeah, no. You show a bit more imagination. Mm. Musically, I was disappointed. <laughs> yeah, I, I I guess they're going for like the music of the time, but I you know I like that sequence with the Guns N' Roses track, and I quite like hearing the Rolling Stones in a movie. You know, whether it's Apocalypse Now or it's it's a rarity, isn't it? <laughs> That's not a rarity, but I like the Rolling Stones enough that whenever they pop up, you know, I think maybe it's a bit of an obvious shorthand street fighting man for the characters in this film. Oh, God, it was that one, wasn't yeah, it? Yeah, it was. Oh, man, that's the worst on the nose. Mm. We should get back to the scene because there's a lot of good stuff. In yeah, it's, we it's a really good, really good sequence. So they they basically take in uh, cases of bushmills to, that the uh, bar owner has no choice in taking. And uh, he's... You know, actually, he's fairly resistant to mm. the idea. He says it's too expensive; nobody buys it. Um, and it does show um, that they're not commanding a great deal of respect. Mm. If uh, you know, he pushes old... back straight away, doesn't he? Yeah, he pushes back straight away and really sticks to his guns and, mm. until he gets the shit beaten out of him. Yeah, yeah. And it's like, well, this is not really that fearsome a mob. You're all, you're standing there, the boss, his psychopath brother, and all the goons are standing yeah, there, yeah. and he's still it pushing implodes back. instantly, doesn't yeah. it? As well, once because uh, Stevie's like, why are you hitting on him? It's like hitting your granddad, and then they just start telling each other to shut up. And uh, for me, I really love that scene. It really makes me laugh, but also it's terrifying because mm. it's so unpredictable. You really don't know yeah. how it's going to go down. And there's a really nice bit with Gary Oldman where he's like looking between the characters and all of his loyalties and he's going just telling everyone to shut no you shut up you shut up it's like children in the playground this is this is one of the things though where it's you know for me it's difficult to sympathize with the old man character because he's 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 nasty he's a stooge he's not on the right side in this scene he's the guy going around tipping over bottles and smashing things up and letting yeah, pubs yeah, run yeah. you know he's, he's why why should i sympathize with this guy you don't have to sympathise with him. You don't have to like befriend him, and I, th- I think you can observe him yeah, but you need as an de- anthropological but experiment. You need, you need a degree of sympathy, and you need a degree of like empathy for the characters. Like even watching Taxi Driver, you know, I I don't like Travis Bickle. I wouldn't mm. like him in real life, but I can empathise with his loneliness. Yeah, sure. And it gets that across. With this, it's just Oldman is volatile. Well, you, later on, you do understand that he's kind of again, it's a bit of a cliche, but he's starved of love and affection, isn't he? And maybe with a bit more compassion, he would have uh, come out differently. Mm. You'll have to highlight those scenes when it's we come the scene to them. Where because... his, uh, his brother, the Judas brother, hugs him and says, uh, and he says, "Oh, you haven't done that in years." Yeah, yeah, yeah. And you can see it in his face. You know, that's all. He ne- all Gary Oldman's character needs is a hug. So obviously, um, Terry is conflicted about what he's just seen and this this does actually put um stevie in the crosshairs yeah to a certain extent stevie gets gets a punch doesn't he and then everybody kind of descends into chaos and ed harris has to drag the gang outside for a bollocking which you know i i I found this stuff really believable you know just like how yeah it's one of the best how yeah how kind of shitly organized they are as as a, a mob you know and how undisciplined they are but i love the scene outside where Ed Harris is just like bollocking everyone, and, <laughs> and yeah, Gary Oldman again. You you see him like he's trying to calm the situation down a little bit, and he's like apologizing to his brother for loving him so much. You mm. know, it's it's good stuff. Mm. So Terry is conflicted and goes to visit Kathleen um, for the um, ubiquitous sex scene in mainstream movie. Oh yeah, topless only nineties. Um, uh... Yeah. Beautiful female lead has to take top off in our rated movie. It's a little bit. Sean Penn takes his top off. Yeah, I mean, he, you know, at this point he's lost, isn't he? You know, 
this is his only anchor to something mm. outside of the two worlds that he's his undercover police officer and but, his, but he's he's crushingly stupid character um if you want something outside of the two worlds that you're stuck between, don't mm. don't involve yourself with somebody who's part of one of the worlds. You know, she's not. She's not. Yeah, yeah. There's no. There's absolutely no way getting involved in this woman is going is going to end well. Given that you're either going to be as unpleasant as her brothers, who she's trying to escape from, you're mm. either going to be part of that crew, or you're going to sell them out. I mean, I know it's obviously setting up setting it up as a tragedy, but yeah, yeah. In doing so, you make your lead man like and. There are several other places later in the movie that he demonstrates breathtaking stupidity. Well, it's not that. He, you know, his character is, you know, somebody that's, n you know, not educated, has lived in quite a uh, an insular life in the Irish mob, and then, like, in the police, he's never kind of had life experience outside of those... Yeah, Twelve years. Twelve years in the police is going to give you some life experience. Yeah, but it's still going to keep your worldview quite narrow, and it's certainly not going to give you scope for much introspection and soul-searching. Whereas taking the uniform off and coming back to your hometown and stepping back into your old life many years later, I think it's going to trigger a lot of things that he's not able to process. Well, well, and that's it. He's processing it out loud. To this the big scene at the end where he has his speech. You know, you you feel how hard he's even reaching for the words, and in the end, he just paraphrases the people who he's trying to escape from. Mm. He just paraphrases Ed Harris's Kate's cold speech. Yeah, we'll we'll come back to Terry later on. So you've got the Mafia meeting where Stevie is unfortunately highlighted as a problem. Yeah, yeah. This is where we get to meet Mr... Was it Mr Borelli? Yeah, yeah. He's, uh, this is his first role, did you know that? Really? Yeah, so this this guy, uh, a friend of Sean Penn's, who is Joe Vitelli Jr., so this guy's son. Yeah. Um, he was a, a composer in L.A. trying to make his way in... In the movies, and Sean Penn flew him out to meet the um, the director and was like, you know, pitching him as, as the composer. Didn't work out, but Phil Gerano apparently was saying he was desperately trying to fill this character role and couldn't find anybody. And Sean Penn was like, you should meet this guy's dad. And he was like, is he an actor? And he was like, no, he's this guy that you're <laughs> looking for. And Gerano was like, the studio aren't going to go for that. But then I think everybody went for it when they met him and apparently mm. he's really charming and funny and he, he, he i think he lived for like another 15 years and just spent his the rest of his life working in yeah. movies as a mobster making good money doing yeah, this role there's some really nice moments in this i did like the um the thing with the crumbs and frankly don't make a yeah mess. yeah yeah so i read an interview with bono of all people but he's saying what you get here is this irishman trying to be an italian he's mm. wearing an armani suit he's trying to sit at the italian table trying to be the gangster that he dreams of and just not having the skills not having the education mm. the years immersed in that culture and discipline it's very odd seeing seeing the character as well it's, you know obviously it's ed harris being brilliant but seeing frankie really ill at ease like a like a little boy isn't yeah, it? yeah yeah which you wouldn't expect from this kind of, kind of towering hulking yeah that's it mob boss but i think this sort of shows you that they've kind of they must have grown up without any parents around mm. you know who knows how or why but it's the irish mob so probably something tragic um and the way he kind of defers to this older man mm. and his authority and you know obviously he's one of the mafia heads but there's still something just about being in the space with a man that or has that commanding presence that Ed Harris really nicely defers to, doesn't he? Yeah. So, I mean, plot-wise, I need to. We need to just sort of cover what's decided at this meeting. Um, Stevie is a thorn in the Italians' side <laughs> because he owes money. Yeah. And and also because as a result of the dockside meeting, um, you know, two two of the enforcers who were meant to collect that money got the shit kicked out of them yeah. by Terry. But there's also a, there's a little aside in Borelli's dialogue where he talks about how. The other gangster had tried to get the money from Stevie, and Stevie had spilt a drink on his cashmere, <laughs> and they, he'd been through lots of dry cleaners, and they couldn't get the stain out. And like he's talking about what an insult that is, you know, to like ruin a man's cashmere. You know, <laughs> bad enough he owes money, and he's like, it's not about the money, but it's about the insult. Frankie decides then that he has to kill Stevie to smooth things over. Well, he's not really given um, given. A choice is he? Borelli says to him, you know. What? Well, what? I don't understand that. It's, it's not. It's not a point blank instruction to kill him. What I don't understand at this point is why Frankie didn't just cough up the eight grand and maybe a bit more to smooth things over, um, and leave it at that. 
Like, if you kill Stevie, you're automatically making it clear to everyone that the Italians have killed Stevie yeah, because yeah. he owes the money. And, you you know, you risk sparking the war that eventually almost happens. Yeah, yeah. And this is this is Frankie's decision. Yeah, yeah. So why doesn't it... Well, you know, why do you have to kill this kid who you presumably fairly fond of? Yeah, he should have paid him off and then... Assume the put, debt. Yeah. Yeah, and, and but Stevie But I think you would... combine the, uh, the insult in the bar and the threat from the... Uh... The mafia, I think he's he's you know he's short sighted. Yeah, yeah, he? it's, know, it is short sighted, and it, it it does kind of incite what happens. Yeah, yeah. later on. I mean, it's like, yeah, that's it. And then even his cover up is you know he's he's winging it basically, and mm. I think he's used to having authority over this small team of men, and expects yeah. that just to sort of for them to follow his word. And obviously, he had counted on his brother's volatility. <laughs> There's a really nice threat in this where um, Borelli says to Frankie, he says. Uh, you need to have good manners in business. He says it wouldn't be proper for us to go into your neighbourhood to solve our problem. I like that. So do you want to talk about the Stevie killing? Or... Yeah, I mean, that's next, right? We go straight into it. There's no sort of time time to breathe. <laughs> we just go straight into Pat walking Stevie out of the bar and then Pat and Frankie pinning Stevie down and cutting his throat. Seems an odd choice of method of murder. I'm not deliberately picking holes in this. It just mm-hmm. seems, well, you know, he's got a pistol with a silencer. Yeah, we yeah. see later on. Why don't we just shoot him? Yeah. Why? Why the throat cutting? Why the sort of drama? Yeah, it? it's it's yeah, it's a bit silly because obviously there's nobody to send a message to. Yeah. You know, there, there's no. They, why didn't they just disappear him? Mm. Just take him off the streets completely. But it looks good. It's a good looking scene. Silhouettes, throat cutting, blood pouring, Armani suits. Okay. <laughs> smoke. Conveniently, Stevie's body is fished out of the river by the police. It's the next day, isn't it? You yeah, the next it day. Like washed out to sea, or just conveniently when Terry and Jackie are, are there to see it, which predictably sends Jackie off into a, a spiralling series of rages. Brilliant, I, brilliant performances here. Really off the hook. I, wild. I've found it a difficult scene. Um, it's it's kind a... of it's it's just kind of that wildness that starts as craziness and then has nowhere else to go except for like a, a moment of comedy with the. You know, and Kate says every time you turn around, yeah, somebody's yeah. being killed, which is a serious point. And he, he kind of goes into stupid, oh, turning around and saying, look, nobody's been killed. Look, yeah, nobody's yeah. been killed. It's like watching a small child. Yeah, but that's it. That's his character, isn't it? Yeah, but it's it's difficult to watch. You know, it's a scene that requires, you know, a bit more nuance and development and building. You know, if... if yeah, if, but he's, he's reactionary. He's not going to have, like, his his broken heart will only materialise in acts of revenge and violence which is how these kind of petty wars and disputes escalate and continue for years and years you know this mm. this reaction is is pretty standard i think for most but i did like kate's um, decision to just walk away from the situation yeah yeah she's she's out <laughs> <laughs> she knows straight away like what a mistake it is to be close to the, and it's slightly clunky that everybody turns up <laughs> underneath the uh, manhattan bridge to watch <laughs> Stevie being fished out of the water. Yeah. But there's a nice bit of um, blocking at the end where Kate drives off and Terry's just standing there and then and then um, Jackie pulls up, pulls up in, in the, the car, car alongside, yeah. which I wasn't expecting. Which is, and they yeah. leads on to a very um, unlikely next scene. Yeah, so Jackie's saying that a friend of theirs from school... Joined the, joined <laughs> joined, the cops. Joined the cops. And, and has been killed, so he's yeah. going to his funeral. Yeah. It just seems peculiar that, A, he would still be interested in, in somebody that he knew who joined the cops, it would be, to me, it would be completely antithetical to him. He would have nothing to do with that person. Yeah, yeah. Um, but he's going to a big police funeral yeah, out yeah. in Queens. I mean, it's beautifully photographed. It's beautifully <laughs> photographed, but it's just like, why are these characters here? You know, drinking, it, it, surrounded by police. And admittedly, Jackie does say later, oh, I feel really uncomfortable when I'm surrounded by yeah. police, when they're drinking in a police bar. I, like, I really like that scene, like the, the balls of this kid, you know, to just go in and sit in a police it's the wake isn't it so that's where the father is he just wanted to pay his respects to mm. this old fella but but this the scene where they're sort of standing watching in, in the in the graveyard in the graveyard kind of drinking got it's cans like, of drink and paper bags cans of drinks smoking like, yeah it's tracking shot left to right looking down at the funeral and there we get the uh the first clue the big twist coming as well don't we where we see john tratura is one of the pool bearers yeah, it just felt like the whole thing in the graveyard just felt like you're writing this, but you're not thinking how it's playing out. It's just really unconvincing. Yeah, I don't know. It felt like there was a, maybe an old loyalty there. Who knows what the connection was between Jackie and the guy in the grave? Mm. 
So the next scene is a really important one for me, and I only um, flagged why it's important watching the movie the second time. It's um, Terry is drunk and becoming frustrated with his situation. Uh, he goes to the subway to meet up with John Turturro's character. I really he's, like this. He's scene. kind of his it's, handler. It's very actory, isn't it? But I really like it. But here's the thing: this is this is what kind of nailed how stupid Terry is for me, <laughs> right? Within this scene, Turturro's character has actually cracked what happens to Stevie. He says, yeah, yeah. He points at, yeah, he comes up point blank with the theory mm. that maybe maybe Frankie did it. Could Flannery have been involved? He get hit one of his own like Stevie for no fucking reason. Money's always a reason. He didn't owe Frankie money. As a favor to impress Borelli. Kid in the river ain't wrapped in a ribbon, but Borelli's sense of self-importance is soothed that this goofball ain't walking the streets no more. What I don't understand is what this Terry character thought was going to happen. Well, he says that. He thought he'd be able to just step in, do a bit of informing, and then step back out again. Yeah, but uh, he's come back to nail his old friends, his best friend. Right, he knew this guy was his best friend. Yeah, yeah. And he's come back and found, oh, he's 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 my best friend, and suddenly had a fit of conscience about it. So this is what you volunteered to do. Yeah, but that's that's what the character is. You know, I think he's he does a good job playing him, and he is like a, a, a an uncomplicated guy that's put into a very complicated situation, and he's out of his depth. But this isn't, you know, this isn't like Prince of the City where everything is falling out from underneath him. He knows exactly what yeah, he's doing. He knows sure. what the situation is. It shouldn't be any more difficult a situation than he planned for. I, I don't get it. I don't yeah, sympathise with his character. Uh, he's, he's emotionally conflicted, isn't he, between what he thinks is morally right in terms of the law and what he thinks is right for the but loyalties this is, that he'd forgotten. This is stuff. He knows, he knows who he's going back to see. He knows his bonds to them. Yeah. This is stuff he should have sorted out in his head before he agreed to do the job. He's not that kind of guy, is he? He's still young. He doesn't always. He's doing not young. That. He's thirty. He's thirty. <laughs> people, people have, <laughs> people have children when they're thirty. People raise yeah, a true, family. True. You yeah, know yeah, what I mean? Okay, yeah. Anyway, sorry, I'll stop ranting. But no, no, it's it's, it's a fair. Good, but it's a really good scene. It's a good scene, and I think his, like you say, Tutura's character is aware of all of these things. It's not like. It's a flaw with the script. I think it's in the script that he is this guy that's out of his depth and conflicted and soul-searching and not quite articulate enough to express himself. I really like the uh, exchange of dialogue towards the end of the scene between Tutura's character and Terry. And uh, he says to, you know, because obviously Tutura's character is a New York cop born and bred and probably tough enough to police the neighbourhood in which he was born. You know, he hasn't run away like... Uh, Terry did, and he says to uh, Terry Noon, he says, right, I, thought, I thought you kitchen guys were, were tough guys. We're not tough, Nick! We're just crazy. Well, you ain't either. You're fucking crybaby. I mean, and that's kind of, it's true. You it's know, true. The script knows it. Sean Penn knows it as he's playing the character. No, it's fair enough. I'll, I'll take that. It's the, the script is aware of what's going on. It's just, it makes it difficult for me to sympathise with the character again if he's such a dullard. I saw you this as should... a teenager, and you saw it as a, a middle-aged man. So True. that's probably what, why, why, why our oh, I sent the relation... chill down my spine when you said that. Then <laughs> that's probably why our relationships to the characters are different. Yeah, very true. Um, with that in mind, you should talk about the next scene because it just has too much for me to to stomach. <laughs> it has sweet child of mine, and it has Gary Oldman beating the shit out of somebody for a <laughs> reason. <laughs> so I really love. I love it, that craziness. But the, so the, the scene that preempts that is um, Ed Harris trying to explain to the rest of the gang why Stevie was killed, apparently. Well, I've, the, the note I've got is, why is Frankie's cover story that the Italians did this? It's a very convoluted cover story. Also, it's a spark, isn't it? It's a sp I mean, why, why, why mention the Italians at all if you're trying to keep the peace with them? If the very point of killing Stevie... Was to keep peace with the Italians. Yeah, yeah. Don't point the finger. Don't at point the finger at the Italians. Don't mention them at all. Just let him have been killed by yeah, someone. Yeah. You know, Jackie's already twigged it. He knows mm. it's Italians because he was there. He was there when the Italians were. Yeah, yeah. Asking for know, the trying money. To, and... Trying to muscle Stevie. Yeah. He knows instinctively. So why why are you kind of like why are you throwing petrol on this? Yeah, yeah. It's I don't understand what. I mean, I guess it's just that he's an inept gangster. That's it. Yeah, we're but, seeing his limitations. But the problem is that that Ed Harris is so authoritative um, and so kind of terrifying in the role mm. that you feel he perhaps has more of an idea of what he's doing than he does. Yeah, that's it. Yeah, he's... Uh, he, we're seeing his limitations here as a... Yeah. As a uh, he's not good at thinking on his feet, is <laughs> no, he? No, no, that's it. You know, he's not a chess player, is he? He's... Uh... 
Well, he he tells uh, Jackie not to retaliate against the Italians, and that because there's some internal beef among the Italians, it's going to get resolved anyway. So just to leave it alone. Given that they're brothers, and he must have known for decades, you know how he behaves. You would have thought he would have, he would have developed better ways of managing him. Mm. You know, you could have taken him aside and said, "Look, I feel the way that you feel. If you're going to tell this ridiculous Italian story." Just say, you know, I, I feel the way that you feel. The time will come. Hold yeah, it yeah. in. Rather than just let him go spiralling off across the bar. Yeah, but I think what he knows is that he's going to react straight away. And because he gives him a very clear instruction not to retaliate against the Italians. So he knows he's going to have to let off steam somehow. So he goes mm. flying down the bar. Uh, punches some guy that's talking to a girl he's loosely involved with. Kicks him to the floor. Smashes a pint glass. All the while, Guns N' Roses are blasting out Sweet Child of Mine. I mean, it's real 90s. Early. It's real, yeah, it's yeah. real 90s blurring the line between are you enjoying this violence or yeah, are, you, or are you shocked by yeah, it? Yeah. Have it both ways. Yeah, that's it. Yeah. It's cool, but it's not that cool. Yeah, yeah and, then, and then he wallops some guy that's watching on the way out as well, which always makes me laugh. I hope that was scripted because the guy gets like a massive kick and a punch <laughs> as Oldman walks out so I hope it's a stuntman and not just some extra do we go straight into the church scene Terry's lost Jackie and so he goes to Kate to ask for help tracking him down mm. and, and Kate knows where he'll be in the church this uh yeah it's, again it's a, it seems I know I'm, I'm picking holes in it obviously but it seems it's one of those unlikely movie moments it's a huge ornate church full of gold um, stuff and it's apparently open to the public to wander in and out. Twenty four hours. Twenty four hours. So yeah, you have the the big. I guess I would call it starts. It... The, you know, I know this scene is quite bloated. But it starts really nice. There's a couple of really nice moments between the three of them, and you can almost see them as children. You know, they're sort of giggling and stuff, and then uh, obviously Gary Oldman runs away with the scene. Yeah, quite quite literally, and he's he's clambering up stuff and and. Uh... Just being, sobbing just and holding being, the saints and being insufferable and at, at great length and I've again I've scribbled terrible music here oh dear. Um, but I can't remember how or why it particularly offended me I just found it is I, I'm going to stop saying this after a while because it's so repetitive but I just I find Oldman in it just too much the character's just too much yeah this one maybe he's he, go, he goes quite far in this one I, I still quite like the performance but it's uh, it's, it's a bit too much and I guess Oldman has his big scene, which is immediately followed by, I think, Penn's big scene, isn't it, this next one? Yeah, this is where um, he's... Extremely drunk. Him and Kay are... Back at Kate's. Back at Kate's place. He's absolutely hammered, isn't he? She's being she's being um, quite supportive, though, considering she's supposed to... Um, this is not a criticism. Mm. You know, I'm, I find it very sympathetic. You know, she's, a, she's a, an independent character, but she is kind of taking care of him and trying to calm him down and settle him down. Yeah, that's it. They're bereaved, aren't they? So uh, Terry more than Kate, I would say, at this point. And then he's drunk and gets quite kind of abusive with her. And it's a very... We don't quite know why. And then he he just confesses that he's an undercover cop. So Yeah. How does the scene end? How does she react to that? So what happens is he confesses and then he throws up straight away in the, in the toilet because he's so drunk mm. and then he gathers his stuff and bolts from the apartment as she's following him trying to clarify what it is that he's just said and he doesn't respond he just gathers up all of his gear and leaves the, leaves the flat and mm. leaves her there kind of stood processing processing it, it. Yeah, yeah exactly that there's a peculiar scene next i have maybe yeah we, we should get a few scenes along but this this next few scenes seem oddly structured to me this is the stuff where it's uh Jackie and Terry in the car doing a bit of gangster work. Yeah, going to visit Burgess Meredith. Yeah, yeah. Um, again, it's one of those things, <laughs> were it me, um, I, I wouldn't have cast Burgess Meredith. He seems like a very kind of self-conscious throwback to old movies. Yeah, it's but a little I, bit distracting as well, yeah, isn't it? It makes it seem... He's good, but he's distracting. Yeah, no, he's good in it, but but his presence makes it makes this seem like much more like an old movie than perhaps it should, given that it's working with some quite old archetypes you know we're going mm-hmm. back to sort of white heat yeah, type, yeah. type storylines here yeah, yeah. You, sh- you know this is a movie that's trying to be a contemporary but it, it sort of it does uh, on that scene with Burgess Meredith it does kind of twist that you know where 
Burgess Meredith was like, oh, you're uh, you're Terry Noonan. I knew your father. He was a good man. He was, mm. you know, one of the old, the old. And he's like, no, my dad was a drunk, and he was uh, really punchy, and he was a really bad father. So you know, yeah, don't romanticize the past. Yeah, that's true. Um, I did find it odd how chipper Jackie was this morning when they're going to do their bit of gangster work. Oh yeah, okay. He's quite upbeat, and he doesn't have a care in the world. Yeah, yeah. You know, he's toying with his axe and all this sort of well, thing. Well, he's still drinking, isn't he? So I think he's yeah. But of, given yeah. given the depth that you kind of sunk to yeah you know the the position that he's in see my note is that this should be structured differently and you know you've got this thing where he's quite chipper here and he seems to be like you know over yeah, he's just it. enjoyed then... like a, a rolling fist fight with the guy that he's collecting money from we see that it's not it's off camera but yeah but he's, he's he's in a good mood and but then later you have a scene where he's you know in in the bar with the italians and he's he's all morose and extremely drunk it's just oh, his yeah. moods just seem to fluctuate i mean i know he's you're gonna say he's unpredictable and he's an alcoholic and he's alcoholic but it, it just his his character does seem a little bit inconsistent. Yeah, I, well, I think there was a subplot in the script that was photographed that they cut out, and so maybe this is uh, sort of left over from that, but it was about them doing more kind of criminal work together and, uh, okay. and sort of reaffirming their loyalty and their, their brothers-in-arms bond and yeah, all so of that, that stuff. And it was about um, taking over the territory of another Irish gangster so that they can sort of consolidate their position in the kitchen. Mm. And I think the film was clocking in at three hours with that, so <laughs> that I think they pulled that whole sequence out. That so makes... maybe, maybe this is an artefact of that. Mm, that makes sense then. Oh, good, okay. Following that, there's Frankie and Kathleen. Uh, Frankie comes to visit, so I keep calling her Kathleen, comes to visit Kate at her job at the hotel um, in a very slightly creepy scene. Yeah. He does kind of, Ed, Ed Harris you, you is get very there. good at putting that very slightly odd kind of incestuous tinge on his protectiveness, isn't it? Yeah, that's it, yeah. And you get their dynamic and how hard she's, she's run from it just mm. from that scene, you know, how little she wants to do with this kind of oppressive yeah. you know, gangster family. Yeah, it's that weird kind of smothering male protectiveness that nobody yeah, yeah. really wants. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. And he does the same thing that he did with Terry. He's He warns her about Terry, saying that he's a murderer, he's killed two men. Mm. Yeah, the next scene is Kate confronting Terry in his apartment in the middle of the night. And it does lead into one of like the better gags in the film as well. He tells her to sit and she stands. You know, there's all these things about men trying to just boss her around all the time. Um, and she says that Frankie's told her that Terry killed two drug dealers. And he says, no, 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 they weren't drug dealers, they were cops. And she says, you killed two cops? Like, it's even more, and he's like, no, no. She's so trying to establish my cover. And then she said, oh, I'm so stressed about this, I've been telling my therapist. And so then he's like, there's a therapist out there that knows I'm an undercover cop that's a mentor. <laughs> I, really, I really like the, the dynamics of this scene. This feels like... It's a very, I want to say, 90s scene where it is it is about kind of... Well, I felt, I'm overstating it, but I felt mildly insulted by the scene. <laughs> <laughs> In the same way that you were kind of offended. How dare you? I was kind of offended by the scene because, and this is about, this is more about the inconsistency of the characters from scene to scene in this section of the film. Mm. So I felt that this was like a very male scene because Terry who had been a complete mess mm. and had found out all sorts of crazy stuff in the last couple of days. Yeah, yeah. Suddenly he's really centred. Suddenly, you know, he's got all the answers and he's really calm and he's, you know, he's he's the grounded one in the scene. Yeah, right, right. And she, who is actually the most together character in the movie, mm. uh, is suddenly panicking and striding around the apartment and doesn't know what to think or do. And he's like, he's suddenly, he's Mr. Cool. He's, he's, he's all together. And he, yeah, you know, yeah that's, that's definitely off. He's, he's off a weird, in that scene. A weird bit of tone. But, but I think what she's done is let her guard down. And this is the kind of avalanche, emotional avalanche that comes from that. And this is just before she rebuilds all of her defenses and, and carries on as normal. And I think this is the danger of being exposed to all this stuff that she's walked away is mm. like, it opens her up to all of this. You know, she is Jackie's sister. She probably has some of that, potential to be really chaotic and unpredictable so yeah. she knows better than to be close to it and i think this scene is about that you know who she could be as opposed to who she wants to be was it was totally a bit weird though yeah me. yeah especially him yeah i hadn't sort of clicked to that because i just i enjoy watching mm. her sort of 
layers. Yeah, and thinking, <laughs> and jumping thinking out loud. Yeah. She's really sort of agile and moving between all of these different kind of states of mind. Mm. I really enjoy that performance. But yeah, his his one is kind of he just sat there watching, isn't he? Yeah, and it felt like a sort of veil, very sort of male centric. Yeah, scene. but I mean, the end of the scene, he doesn't know how to respond to all of this depth and emotion that she's shown him, and so mm. all he does is try to like seduce her, he tries to kiss her, and yeah. you know, make her feel better with his body, and she just like pushes him away and is like, "Get away! You don't get it." You know? Next sequence is um, Jackie executing the Italian gangsters. I don't know if he's laying in wait in the bar or it's just a coincidence that they come in. It feels like a coincidence because he's been there for a while and then he just happened to turn up. Yeah, yeah. They? And they're looking at him and like, oh, we think you're one of the Flannery boys. Like, they don't even know who he is. You know, that's, I mean, it also shows you how kind of... Yeah, unknown off, they are. Yeah, yeah, how, yeah, how low they are in the pecking order. And they invite him over for a drink to sit at their table, but this is the guy that um, his brother has told him killed Stevie. Yeah. So when he draws up next to the table he just pulls out his pistol and shoots them all dead and then there's a really oh my god i love it this he marches out of the bar at like f full speed the camera tracks alongside of him as he gets into his car camera spins around the car and then goes up onto a crane shot as he goes <laughs> screeching out of uh, manhattan oh yeah. yeah it's really overblown i love it <laughs> but he's so good that way he just marches across the road cars screeching up to him i think that's really mm. cool uh, the next scene I've just got, Frankie is unhappy. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, this is a scene where Frankie pins Jackie up against the wall and, uh, you know, he he realises that the whole thing is falling apart. Like, it's any chance of, uh, you know, franchising out to the Italians has been lost because of his brother's well, behaviour. because of his own ineptitude as well. Yeah, but I don't think he's, he's that self-aware <laughs> enough to, to point the finger at himself, yeah. so... Uh, yeah, he sort of clears the bar and he screams at everybody, kicks everybody out and then just sits there trying to work out what the hell yeah. to do, yeah. The next sequence, which is, I mean, maybe it's overwrought. I I quite like it. I mean, it's the, it is the uh, visualisation of the metaphoric ticking clock. Yeah, I find this this was a sequence that I think most directors could have done better. It feels like a like what would be a classic De Palma scene. Yeah, yeah, exactly. I'm, you know, I'm not a massive De Palma fan, but I think this sort of sequence would be like a gift. To yeah, him. well, he gets when he gets the timing right. De Palma is yeah. like, and he's airless. as you say, he's he's got it's got all those elements that De Palma would use to make things absolutely obvious and crystal mm. clear. It actually has an alarm clock ticking yeah, away yeah, time yeah. on the, you know, and waiting for a phone call and that sort of thing. Mm. Um, you know. One location overlooking another, which yeah, gives yeah. you, you know, perfect choice of yeah, camera Yeah, it's about two or three minutes too long. This sequence, isn't it? And it doesn't, it doesn't really build any tension. It doesn't help that you've uh, got no, Gary I... Oldman kicking off and then not kicking yeah, off, yeah. kicking off and then not kicking off, and it just doesn't build. Oh no, I disagree. Shame. I remember seeing it the first time and feeling that tension and feeling like, you know, I was holding my breath. And but I mean, that tension's kind of innate in the situation. I like you watch it for the first time. Yes, but you want to know the what happens. Camera moves, but, they know, do you, accentuate that. But you watch it a second time, and it's just dead air to me. When you watch a, a brilliantly constructed sequence, even if you've seen it before and you know what's going to happen, mm. you you will still be manipulated by it, and you'll oh, still yeah, feel yeah. you know a lot of that. That's why you know you can watch Aliens and still be thrilled, even though you know what's going to happen. Yeah, sure. in each. But um, it just felt like a bit inert the second time I watched this. Uh, yeah. So I've knocked it I, right down. I need you to build it back up. Well, then. no, I'm, I kind of agree that it's it's a little, a uh, little overlong, and it could have been trimmed down. There's some moments in it I really like, I like Gary Oldman in the background, posing with his gun, where he's just sort of taking stances and holding in different mm. angles and seeing how it fits and feels. And I like the confusion at the end of the sequence where he's like, okay, let's go, you know, time's up, let's go and hit the Italians. And Sean Penn's trying to talk him out of it. <laughs> and he, he, just that simple thing of, no, he said, if we don't ring, or if yeah. we do ring, and just yeah, the confusion, just kind of like... it's such a simple manipulation that it's it speaks volumes about Jackie's character that he couldn't even remember the simplest instruction, mm. partly because he's an unpredictable alcoholic. And basically the Italians say, like, your brother is a thorn in our side, like both of ours. If we're going into business together, you need to sort that out. And Ed Harris, he's saying, oh, you know, I know he's really embarrassed about this. And the gangster just says it's to him, like... It's so feeble, isn't it? Yeah, yeah, he says, like, don't embarrass yourself <laughs> when he's sitting at my table. Like, don't do this. Yeah. The, the meeting overruns. 
Jackie and his crackpot crew. I mean, at this point, shouldn't Sean Penn have called in the cops or something and just be well, like, that's what you think. If it's going to turn into street warfare, where people <laughs> yeah, are, I'm in the yeah. middle of something that could go horribly yeah. wrong. Um, I, I just, you know, I've lost all, lost all faith in the character at that point. Is he's what is he? Is he reporting anything back? Is he telling his superiors that there's about to be an alliance between the Irish yeah, and the yeah, Italians? That's it. You know, that it's, what what's going on? It's, it just seems to be like a... a, a There's a distinct lack of police work yeah. <laughs> happening at the moment. He's just like a, a dullard wandering around now. Um, yeah. It looks like it's about to kick off at yeah, any and then moment. It, even and then it just point. kind of fizzles when Ed Harris comes out. The Italians see them turning on their toes when they realise Ed Harris is still alive and... Well, I mean, the very fact that there's a, a, a big mob of Irish coming up to the restaurant would, would, for me, even if nothing had happened there and then, it would scupper any chance of a deal. Yeah. I don't know why the Italians... You but know, they, they're not going to react like that. They're not going to say, oh, the deal's off the table, you just come back. They'll just be like, OK, when the time's right, we'll wipe them all out mm-hmm. because this is, this is a waste of energy. Yeah. It's very unprofessional. But he does say to him that, that line, in a war, we would crush you, just... Making sure he knows exactly where they are in the, uh, in the packing order. In the pecking order of yeah. <laughs> New York's gangsters. So, from this point on, you basically got you know the the betrayal plot working itself out, where um, Frankie sets up Jackie. You know, Has to really. He's got no option, is he? I mean, from here on, the third act is kind of by the numbers. We have brother betraying brother. Jackie ends up being executed by Frankie and then Sean Penn is witnessing it but he's too far away to engage and save his best friend's life and then he calls the cops and they go to the wrong location after the blah 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 blah. Uh, there's one really good throwaway line from John Turturro when Sean Penn's blathering on about you know what's happening and how out of his depth he is and John Turturro just says I'm not your social worker <laughs> like just do your job man that's what you're here for I can't understand at this point why the whole thing isn't just shut down I mean, well, I think it is essentially because from now on, you know, Sean Penn is his character is kind of he's always been out of his depth, but now he's just but this given is, up on any kind of resolution through the legal system and just goes down the old fashioned. But this is the thing where the, the the police should like literally be shutting the case down, taking him in for debriefing, getting him off the streets, yeah, exactly, yeah. Um, one way or another, and just just moving in. This is where it becomes kind of like old old fashioned old movie yeah, you sure. know, where it kind of overrides logic and overrides any kind I mean, of you modernity. could say classic you didn't have to say uh, old fashioned you could say it becomes classic yeah classic. but it's just making your lead character seem completely devoid of, of any internal life or motivation and just kind of guiding him towards the big shootout that you want to see at the end there is a scene where um, Terry and Kate uh, you know he kind of pleads with Kate and, and tries to get him but she literally shuts him off and, yeah, that's, and, yeah. and walks away and that's really refreshing yeah, it's a really nice sequence that you know and he is I, I think it's a really good performance from him but it it shows you how kind of limited the character is yeah. in his kind of soul searching self analysis when he's kind of talking about angels and believing in a state of grace and like just you know he's really rambling and hasn't got a grasp on really what the world collapsing around him but he's trying to find some way to reconnect with her like it's his last chance isn't it if he doesn't reconnect with her then it's plan b which is you know the suicide run and there's no no turn that he can make now that well i mean there's the obvious one where he could just go back to his police job and just walk away from all this stuff but he can't because there's still you know his best friend has been killed yeah but there's no you don't have to you don't have to take on personal responsibility for that but i think he feels directly responsible for it but this is this is this is the thing. This is where I, this is where I can't sort of sympathise with the character. Think you're a policeman. This stuff happens. <laughs> yeah, yeah. This is going to be what's happening He's when you infiltrate an Irish mob. Yeah, you know, yeah. you have forgotten what you're here to do, even though you've just been reminded of it by one of your superiors. Mm. You know, you should be stepping back at this point. But I, this is where I think it's like movie artifice. It's like you have to have the shootout. Yeah, yeah. He wakes up in Grand Central Station. Yeah. Bag of guns. Yeah. What's the geography of this? Because I thought Hell's Kitchen was sort of like, uh, it's like on the, the west. Yeah, it's on the west. So, I mean, he seems like the parade's going on like up Fifth Avenue, isn't it? I mean, he only crosses over the parade. He doesn't really... He's got a fair bit of walking to do, hasn't he? Yeah, yeah. He but... seem, it seems like in the film, he seems like he's crossing the parade just to get into a bar that happens to be right there. Yeah, he is, yeah. Interesting. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> walking, crossing the parade... And then lots of killing. Yeah, that's pretty much how it, how it plays out. I always love this ending. I find it very satisfying. Yeah, oh, it's a good shoot. It's nicely violent. Yeah, there is there's a mis edit in it though. I don't know if you spotted that. No. When uh, one of the guys comes down the stairs 
the Champagne shoots there's a blood pack explosion and then there's a second one without the sound of a gunshot and then we cut back to Sean Penn he shoots again but then the next shot is the guy falling down like it's it's all out of oh, time oh she's shit that Claire Simpson well, I don't know where she got that I think it. somebody else must have touched it <laughs> while it was being prepped for a play out or something yeah right. because it, it's such a clunky cut that for a long time when I was younger, I was looking for like a director's cut or something to try explain and explain yeah. that clunky edit. Yeah, so I, I mean, I don't think it's him. It must have been somebody else that touched he's, it. He's a music video director, though, wasn't he? He's <laughs> yeah, just like, he's very, well, I like the way that the blood sprays. Don't worry about logic. Yeah, that's, yeah, yeah, that's it. Yeah. But it's it's a nice sequence. You know, there are kind of continuity errors and there are, mm. you know, uh, inconsistencies in bullet holes and that sort of thing but I don't really care when I watch it I just well you have seen it 50 times I mean I haven't spotted any inconsistencies it's just like a good violent scene yeah it's really nice it's good catharsis but unfortunately for me it's because I've been picking holes in the character motivation and everything all the way through I just don't you think it at least makes sense that given his intellectual limitations and stunted emotional development that resolving this uh, conflict between Frankie and himself, it had to be this way. There was, there's no way he's going to cuff him and take him to jail. Can we find a middle ground? Can Terry go in with a backup of about five or six cops, and there's a shootout anyway? We don't want any innocent cops killed just because of his incompetency as a police officer. This is true. Oh, yeah, I'm just more more collateral damage for, for Terry. Sergeant Jones, Terry's scorecard, <laughs> father of two, <laughs> gets dragged into a Irish bar shootout for no reason. I like uh, I like the way the shootout is choreographed. You know, it's not kind of one of these Asian-inspired car- moments of carnage. It's definitely a throwback to it's a western. Yeah, to western Peck and Par, and yeah. you know the the just even the squibs. You know, I like I like seeing squibs mm. and the slow mo and the, uh, the I like, smoke and the I like neon to and sort of feel it's a, it's like a quite confined space, mm. um, and you're kind of scrabbling around in small spaces, tr- just trying yeah, to hide from bullets. Oh yeah, yeah, there's no kind of like launching yourself across rooms and yeah, rolling, cameras yeah. gliding across to catch you. It's, no, it's, it's all quite desperate. Yeah, that's it. Yeah, yeah, it's very uh, claustrophobic, isn't it? Mm. Yeah, and I like the glasses exploding and the sound design and the sound of footsteps and you know. Very and it's distant, it's, echoey gunshots. It's good in terms of character. I really, I really like the way that basically after you've done all the elaborate stuff and it turns into Terry shooting at Frankie and Frankie shooting at Terry, just kind of strips it down to their hatred of each other. Yeah, yeah. They're just standing there, don't care if they get hit, they mm-hmm. just want to shoot and shoot and shoot at each other yeah. until one drops. Well, actually, Terry, he waits till Frankie's emptied his clip. Yeah. So we see the mechanism on his pistol lock back and then... Terry shoots him in the head. But it's just chance that, isn't it? They are still just blasting yeah, I mean, it. He's it's, not hiding from the bullets. No, it's... no, no. And it's a pretty wild uh, uh, approach to a gunfight. But, you know, it, it looks cool on camera. Feels more like a duel. Yeah, nice. Where there's, you know, there's no avoiding each other. You're just face-to-face shooting yeah, until one it, of yeah. you goes down. Yes. I mean, and that's the end of the film, right? There's no uh, denouement past this. No, you do get to see Kate looking ambiguous amongst the St. Patrick's Day crowd. I, I kind of read her ambiguity as kind of like a, a cold relief, not being part of this world anymore. Yeah, that's it. She hasn't been dragged into the, the yeah. bloodletting and the violence she's done. And then the final shot is just Terry slumped in the bar, blood seeping out of him mm. as we cut to the credits. And, yeah. and we're done. One of the greatest films of all time. <laughs> that's it it's done so look you know obviously I have a lot of affection for this film I saw it when I was young and impressionable and it's kind of stayed with me you know I, I see the flaws that you're talking about and uh, I can live with them no I mean there there are films that I've seen and bonded with when I was very very young and you do as you get older see the flaws in them but at the same time you know they still work for you yeah. and I'm not saying that you turn a blind eye to these flaws and you know it's just nostalgia making it work. The film still works as a whole. Mm. Unfortunately, because I saw this, as you said, as a middle-aged man, it, it didn't really hit home for me. Mm, true. You know, as I kind of hinted at earlier, I felt it was just kind of an old-fashioned movie. I have, I mean, it's it's a major problem for me that, that Sean Penn is, is not one of my favourite actors by any stretch. Sure. Um, and I, I like Gary Oldham when he's more controlled, but I do think this is way over the top so it, it didn't really land for me and it's a shame because you know there's a lot of people involved in it that I like normally I like Ennio Morricone but I don't think he's doing good work here I do like Jordan Cronenworth and I like a lot of his movies but I think this is looks very much of its time 
no, oh, no, I, I love the photography in this, you know, I love everything about it. And I think as, as I've grown with it, I think I'm giving it like massive passes on, you know, the characters, especially, you know, I think seeing that their limitations as I've grown older than the characters, mm. you know, when I was young looking at them, I, you know, I loved their sort of chaos and freedom and their introspection as well. I didn't know many people that really talked about their feelings when I was 19 years old serving in the military. So to see these kind of guys pouring it out there, either Gary Oldman showing his physicality or Sean Penn struggling to articulate it, you know, I really liked, again, I said it before, the ambition of the piece emotionally and cinematically. And it's one of those films that I just enjoy stepping back into that world and spending time with those characters as they kind of make their mistakes and there's a, a sadness to it to do with the broken friendship and you know those kind of things I just it still resonates with me every time I watch it and when I, I look back on it now having seen it so many times and sort of grown up with it and kind of grown past it but still having that affection there's a line that Kate has at the beginning about being nostalgic for mayhem mm. and I feel that when I watch the film you know that it's so out of control okay. when I am nostalgic for mayhem this is the film I'll go back to